So I, I come from the uh, People's Republic of Massachusetts, and uh, where we unfortunately only have one Democratic senator, not like this state, uh, two, but hopefully that will change uh, later, uh, later this year. Um, we're, we are certainly not uh, experts in population health management, but uh, are maybe a little bit ahead of the rest of the country and wanted to share with you uh, some lessons uh, that we've learned and, and share some of our thinking uh, with you. Uh, what I thought I would do is comment on two things, which uh, have been getting a fair amount of attention these days. One is, what, what is the truth about Massachusetts health reform? There's a lot of uh, demagoguery about it, both positive and negative. Uh, and then I would also share with you some of our experience and some of our thinking within Mass General and partners about population uh, health management. So uh, Massachusetts uh, has passed uh, several different uh, acts related to health care in, in recent years. The most notable is the first one listed here, Chapter 58, which was uh, focused on expanding uh, coverage to uh, almost all residents within the Commonwealth. Uh, that was the uh, act that uh, included the individual mandate. Uh, it also uh, established uh, what we call a connector in the federal legislation is referred to as exchanges and, and developed and provided a marketplace where products for previously uninsured people could be marketed directly uh, to them. And it also established a health care quality and cost uh, commission as well. I think one of the unexpected and probably positive aspects of Massachusetts health care reform is not only did it expand uh, access, as I'll show you in, in a few minutes, but it also created uh, an environment where the state is very focused on costs. I think one of the consequences of bringing almost everyone into the insurance pool is the fact that we all feel uh, collectively part of the same health care uh, system broadly defined, and, and the focus on costs has really intensified as a result of that. And as you can see, there have been two subsequent uh, cost bills that were passed by the legislature in 2008 and 2010, which included things like uh, more transparency, a regular report from the Attorney General, a payment reform commission, uh, the uh, establishment of limited and tier uh, network uh, products, and a price reform commission. And we're expecting this summer yet another wave of uh, legislation on Beacon Hill that will, uh, it will probably gradually outlaw fee-for-service medicine within the state of Massachusetts, create a path toward the migration toward a uh, alternative payment systems and may also include uh, rate regulation and, and that is a major bone of contention within the state uh, as we speak. Uh, here is one of the outcomes of Massachusetts health reform. There is no doubt that access has been dramatically expanded. If you were to go back a few years before 2004, roughly 8 or 10 percent of the population in Massachusetts had no health insurance. That number is down around uh, 2% as a result of this uh, combination of individual mandates and, uh, and these connector uh, products. So this is something that we are uh, extremely proud of. Now, one issue that has been raised about Massachusetts health reform is hasn't it blown the budget uh, for, state, for the state uh, and hasn't it also led to dramatically increased costs in Massachusetts? I didn't bring about a slide about the latter, but the rate of uh, rise in health care costs in Massachusetts over this period has been significantly lower than the rest of the country. So I don't think there's any truth to the fact that uh, health care costs have accelerated as a result of mass health reform. Uh, I, I think another statistic, and, and what I've shown here is a slide that digs into the first issue, namely, what has it done to the state budget and who has paid for this? Now, in Massachusetts, we started out with a bit of an advantage in that we started prior to health reform with something we refer to as a free care pool, a state insurance company and provider-funded pool of funds that helped hospitals that uh, cared for a disproportionate share of the uninsured. And so in the bottom of this uh, slide, um, this is this, so $680 million is of the roughly $2 billion that mass health reform has cost came from redirecting this, uh, this uh, free care pool. Uh, only about uh, $200 million or $300 million has come from an increase in state revenue and, and an increase in the federal match. The majority of the new revenue in the system has come from people who previously sat on the sidelines and are now paying premiums into the health care system. So it's, it's really uh, the individual mandate or some people like to call it a, a, a tax, uh, is what has, uh, has resulted in most of the new revenue uh, flowing into the system. The impact on the state budget has been uh, really modest. What has affected the state budget more than anything is, is the economy and the downturn in revenue, not an increase in health care costs. Um, 
focusing again on the cost side, like I said, there is um, uh, payment reform commission in 2009, was, which was established by the legislature, uh, came out with a strong recommendation that uh, the state migrate toward a global payment system. Uh, an AG report, which we weren't too uh, happy about, basically said that the care, as best they could measure, among all the providers in the state, all the hospitals, all the physicians, was the same, and so that the variation in payment that was seen across the state was totally uh, unjustified. Series of cost trend hearings uh, over the last two years, uh, where some people concluded that prices were driving cost growth and that the variation in pricing uh, is an issue. For some reason in Massachusetts, it uh, comes as a bit of a surprise to people that academic medical centers get paid more than community hospitals and that there's some variability in the payment rates for uh, each of those uh, categories. Uh, there is more, most recently a Provider Price Reform Commission which uh, suggested that price variation should be reduced and that there was a need for market uh, intervention. And then uh, some, our governor, uh, Governor Deval Patrick, filed some legislation in February, again calling for this migration away for the fee, from the fee-for-service system and also through the Insurance Commission in Massachusetts putting in place regulation of both uh, insurance rates and, uh, and through the insurance companies, uh, providers uh, as well. Um, so I, I think if you sum it all up, um, Massachusetts has 98% of its uh, population insured. Nationally, that figure is 83%. We have seen an increase in the percentage of employers offering insurance, not a decrease that was uh, feared. Uh, our, our health reform bill includes only modest uh, penalties for uh, insurers that don't provide uh, insurance to their employees. And so uh, we're, we've been pleased that the, ins the employer community has stepped up and uh, increased their, their accountability and responsibility for offering insurance. Um, like I said, spending is, uh, is tracking, I mean, is, is above uh, average for the country, but that's because our cost of living in Massachusetts is above average uh, for the country. But if you look at the cost trends uh, since mass health re reform was passed, uh, we've been growing uh, less, uh, less quickly. Um, there has been an increase in preventive care visits among our population, that's up 5%. A decrease in the use of the emergency department, that across the state is down about 4%. And although federal health reform is pretty unpopular around the country, based, uh, and, and it's based largely on the Massachusetts model, in Massachusetts itself, two-thirds of the population is quite pleased with mass health reform. So in the state that actually has done this, there's great satisfaction uh, with it as, as well. Um, as you, and as you, I summarize on this chart, you can see that what happened in Massachusetts, although sometimes the language is different, is, uh, is almost identical to the model that went into the Affordable Care Act with individual, um, an individual mandate, some modest uh, employer penalties for not providing insurance, and the establishment on a state-by-state -state basis of marketplaces in the national legislation called exchanges and Massachusetts called a connector. So, uh, Having said that, I, I think the hill to climb across the country is much greater than it was in Massachusetts. Federal health reform is more difficult for a couple of reasons. One, we started out with 10% of the population being uninsured. Across the country, it's more like 15 to 17%. Uh, we started out with this free care pool. In most uh, parts of the country, there is no reimbursement, no pool of funds available to care for the uninsured. Uh, and thirdly, Massachusetts health reform was passed with an overwhelming consensus among the business community, the insurers, providers, and the public, whereas, as we all know, in, uh, in Washington, uh, health, national health reform uh, passed by a, uh, a razor's edge, and ever since that moment, there have been people on the other side of the issue who have been trying to, uh, to kill it. So the political uh, uh, constituency behind it is much more uh, fragile. So at this point, I'm going to turn to the second topic I wanted to cover, uh, which is uh, our experience with population health management. Uh, and uh, Tim uh, covered a little bit of uh, background about Mass General Hospital, um, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't dwell on this. Partners Healthcare was founded in 1994 uh, when we saw, uh, and the Brigham saw, this uh, wave of uh, capitation spreading the market, and, uh, and we felt that, that it was quite likely um, that we, we and the Brigham would be, be better able to advance our missions if we were to uh, team up together rather than to continue to compete with one another. This sent a, a shockwave across the Boston uh, healthcare marketplace. It also created quite a tremor within our own uh, organization. I'll never forget that one of my most senior uh, professors at Harvard Medical School told me that for most of his adult life, his world had been shaped by the presence of three enemies. One was the Soviet Union, the second was the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the third was Yale University. <laughs> and now only Yale was left. <laughs> so his, uh, his life and his world had changed uh, dramatically. Uh, 
We uh, started just with the MGH and the Brigham, but uh, Partners has now gone on to include uh, uh, several community hospitals, a psychiatric hospital, McLean Hospital, four rehabilitation hospitals, some skilled nursing facilities, and, uh, and a network of about a thousand, over a thousand uh, primary care physicians, some of whom are at the MGH and the Brigham, but some uh, associated with our community hospitals and some in uh, freestanding uh, practices as well. And then we also uh, have a major commitment to community health centers as well. MGH is the largest employer in the city of Boston and, uh, and Partners is the largest private employer in the state of Massachusetts. So, uh, so this is one of a number of different graphs that I could show you that just makes the point that the current trends in healthcare spending in this country are unsustainable. This particular graph looks at healthcare premiums over the last 13 years or so and compares those to workers' earnings and inflation. I could show you another graph that looks at um, uh, healthcare as a percentage of GDP or our healthcare expenditures relative to other uh, countries. Uh, these, these trends are simply un unsustainable. And, uh, and something is going to uh, have, have to give. I don't think it's likely that um, if you just straight line things that in 20, 30 years that 100% of our economy becomes devoted to health care. It would make for pretty boring cocktail parties among other, uh, among other things. Um, so something has to give in this curve. And in my mind, there are two options. One is that um, these trends can continue and we will eventually have to cut into the muscle of uh, health care in order to uh, uh, to address the downward cost pressure, or we will respond much more proactively and thoughtfully and somehow figure out a way to trim out the fat. And those of us in, who work in healthcare know that there is uh, quite a bit of fat to be uh, trimmed out. Uh, although I'm a big uh, Apple uh, product consumer, I, I did like this quote from Bill Gates. He wrote, or he said recently that uh, politicians must address tough questions about limited resources. How many teachers are you willing to fire in order to have 78-year-olds have a procedure which will be invented five, five years from now that adds four months to their life? That sounds terrible, but infinitely choosing those things will shift you away from education for the young and towards infinite invention of such medical procedures. So as a result of the pressure that healthcare is putting on federal budgets, state budgets, employer budgets, city budgets, individual budgets, these kind of uh, trade-offs are being made as we sit here today. And I think we have a responsibility to try to uh, bend the cost curve and, and make sure that our society has the resources to educate our young, invest in the infrastructure that our country uh, desperately needs, uh, et cetera. So this, uh, I, I, in this case, agree with uh, Mr. Gates, although I don't particularly like his products. Um, so here, here is how we are thinking uh, about the world. Um, we believe, uh, if we look at our patient population, that well, I, sh I should add that we have flipped, we have become a pioneer ACO and flipped our two major contracts to global payments. I'll get into that in a moment. And so we expect that about 40% of our patient care revenue will come through the, those three major uh, contracts. Another 60% will continue to be referral management. Uh, some of which will come from other groups that are providing, um, doing population management, but need to uh, purchase services from other providers for tertiary, quaternary care. And then there will be some uh, old-fashioned uh, fee-for-service medicine that will continue to come to us uh, through our referral uh, business. Uh, our strategy, simply put, is to manage the costs in both lines of business, uh, to no negotiate contracts that reward efficiency, uh, and to focus uh, internally on improving quality and efficiency. This chart up here just summarizes uh, sort of what I just said. About 82% of our clinical patients across partners come from Eastern Massachusetts, 18% from other Massachusetts and uh, other states. 19% uh, of that 82% are patients whose primary care is based at either the MGH or the Brigham. Uh, another 18% comes from primary care physicians in our network, and about 44% from other uh, primary care physicians in the region or self-referrals. Uh, so we believe we're going to be uh, operating in at least two and a half businesses going forward. One is uh, global uh, payments and the management of our own uh, populations cared for within our primary care practices. And then the other is referral business, some of which will, which will be coming from other providers who are also doing population management and others from other providers who aren't. Um, again, I, th I think this. Uh, view of the world sort of changes your perspective on healthcare. For many, most of our professional lives, we have focused as hospitals, healthcare systems, physician practices on trying to 
uh, on the center of this, uh, these concentric circles, trying to deliver inpatient and outpatient encounters as effectively, uh, safely as we possibly can. Uh, more recently, we've uh, expanded the aperture and tried to think th about episodes of illness, uh, which are supported by bundled uh, payments, and think about how to uh, manage episodes of illness for hip replacement or bypass surgery as efficiently and effectively as possible. But I, I think that global payments creates the most opportunity for finding opportunities to trim the fat in the system. It really focuses on the management of a population of people over the course of a year, and, uh, and I think um, it is, provides a new and exciting way to think about our uh, organizations and, and, and advancing our missions. Um, we've done some modeling to think what is this going to do to our activity, our inpatient volume, both in the short term and the long term. We think that it's quite likely that in the short term, both our population health management activity and our referral activity may see a, a short term dip. Um, po the population, because we're trying to actively manage down the utilization and, uh, and and on the referral business because there are other providers in the marketplace uh, trying to do the same. But over the long term, we think that there may be opportunities to reverse those trends and, uh, and become busier. Over here, by increasing our primary care base uh, and caring for more uh, people in our population uh, management activity, and also trying to encourage our network to be more, more loyal to us. Right now, if you look at the primary care physicians in our Peachy, our partners network, only about 50 or 60 percent of their referrals are actually coming to our academic medical centers. We're uh, going to be providing them with incentives to increase that uh, number uh, dramatically, and so we think if we can reduce the leakage from our own network, that this that might drive uh, this number uh, up. Uh, the same is also true on the referral side. Um, we, we are, in all likelihood, going to be ag more aggressively marketing our services nationally and internationally. There's a big uh, world out there that we can potentially draw uh, patients from, and so that, uh, we think, in the long term, creates an opportunity uh, for us as well. Now, you may be at, sitting here wondering, why have we decided to jump into the population health management pool with both uh, feet? And I think the most important reason is the one up at the top of this chart. Um, the institution that I represent, Mass General Hospital, has built its reputation over the last 200 years by trying to tackle head-on the most important public health problems uh, facing our society. Uh, those could be influenza uh, epidemics, wars, polio, HIV, a um, cancer, heart disease. I, I believe that one of the biggest healthcare problem, if not the biggest healthcare problem, uh, facing our population and threatening their health is the cost of healthcare itself. And so we have decided to, uh, to jump into this pond because we don't really think we have any other choice, that we need to take a leadership role in trying to figure out how to unleash the talent within our organization to tackle this problem and see how, if we can indeed uh, bend the cost curve in a way that makes care better but more affordable at the same time. We are also convinced that uh, the efforts to reduce healthcare spending by the government, by the private sector, are not uh, going away. This is not a short-term uh, phenomenon that we can weather and, uh, and then live happily ever after. We also think that this, from a more crass business standpoint, is probably the lesser of two evils, because if you continue with business as usual, with fee-for-service medicine, given the pressure on the federal budget, state budgets, and, uh, and business budgets, uh, chances are you're going to see be providing the same services at lower and lower unit uh, reimbursement. That doesn't seem like a very attractive uh, picture. We think uh, a world of global payments where you can redesign care, uh, control utilization, and share on the back end with uh, shared savings, and also create some capacity that you can use for other purposes, namely a referral uh, business, uh, is a more attractive uh, business model for us to pursue in the future, and also one that we think is more responsible as well. And lastly, and I'll describe in a moment, we have some limited experience with doing this that we're pretty uh, bullish and excited about, and have a lot of people in the organization that want to roll up their sleeves and, and tackle this in, in a much uh, broader uh, way. So these are at least four reasons why we've decided to jump into this pool, but I would say that the first is by far the most uh, important. So uh, about six years ago, when mass, certainly federal health reform was nothing more than a glimmer in people's eyes, uh, we decided to uh, sign up to do a Medicare demonstration project, not the home care one that this organization has joined, but something focused on high-cost uh, beneficiaries. 
because as you know, there are about 10% of Medicare beneficiaries that are responsible for almost 70% of the costs. And if you're gonna manage Medicare costs, you need to manage the costs of the, that subpopulation of the Medicare population. And so we were pleased uh, to be selected as a, one of the sites of a three-year demonstration project that ultimately turned into a six-year uh, project. And when we uh, got the list of our 2,500 uh, sickest Medicare patients who were part of our demonstration project, the average one of them was, had, was on 13 medicines, was hospitalized uh, three and a half times a year, and their average annual costs were $24,000. This is uh, the medicines from one patient in this demonstration project put on uh, her uh, doctor's uh, desk in his office. Uh, so these are the extremely uh, sick uh, patients who have about a 20% mortality rate and consume 70% of Medicare's budget. I think some of them are the ones that the Senator was referring to in, in the last uh, talk. What we did was to uh, build a whole care management program around our primary care practices. I guess now we talk about medical homes. Uh, that was a relatively foreign topic back then, but we in embedded 12 case managers within our primary care practices. They followed these uh, 2,500 patients uh, very closely, not so much when they were in the hospital or in front of their physician, but when they were at home and there were signs that trouble might be uh, brewing. Uh, they developed very close personal relationships with their patients, their families, worked closely with the physicians, uh, and, uh, and the payment model was, is, was very similar to what is now uh, proposed under the shared savings uh, program of Medicare. We had to, uh, through our savings, pay for the program and save Medicare 5% uh, on top of that, and we were paid, uh, basically fronted the um, uh, infrastructure cost by Medicare, but were at risk for those if the program wasn't successful. Uh, what ultimately happened is that 87% of beneficiaries enrolled, and, and that is a key statistic because if you look at the for-profit disease management company or disease management pro programs that payers um, manage, if they can get to 50%, they're doing cartwheels. I, I think this work is much more appropriately and effectively done in a provider organization. People responded very well when they got a call from their primary care physician's office asking if they would be willing to participate in this program that their doctor was part of, and almost 90% of our patients uh, said yes. Um, if you just look at the outcomes, hospitalization rates over the three or six year period for this population was, uh, went down 20% compared to the control group. ED visits were 25% compared to the control group. And, and not only did we decrease utilization significantly, but the mortality rate was also less than the control group. Uh, so we, um, the total savings for the program were 12% uh, over the six-year period of time. And when you take, took into account the cost of the program, which was about 5% of premium, the net savings were 7%. Uh, if you were to extrapolate these savings over the entire uh, Medicare population, again, these, this is, uh, these patients are responsible for 70% of the cost, this program would reduce Medicare expenses by 4%. And another way to think of it is for every dollar we spent on the program, we saved uh, $2.65. So had a very uh, positive return uh, on investment. So, uh, so this gave us some confidence that this was doable and, uh, and could be done in a win-win way. I should ma mention that uh, our uh, physicians loved this program. These were the patients that our primary care physicians left the hospital every night thinking they hadn't quite uh, done all they could to make them better or keep them, uh, keep them healthy. The patients loved the program, loved having access to this case manager who knew them uh, inside and out and could, was always available to them. Uh, and, uh, and it obviously had successful outcomes as well. So we decided uh, in the wake of this program to, like I said, jump into this pool with both uh, feet. We converted our uh, contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to a global payment contract, subsequently did the same with Tufts, and, uh, and signed up to be one of the um, 32 pioneer ACOs around the country, five of whom are in Massachusetts. Uh, the leader of our effort across partners uh, in population health management is a very talented young physician named Tim Ferris. Uh, this is his uh, chart, which basically shows the 20 tactics that we are in various stages of implementing that have been shown to be effective in managing uh, population uh, health care, ways of making care better and more affordable. Um, and, uh, and they range from focusing on uh, access to the actual design of care to actual measurement and focus on the work that a primary care physicians need to do, uh, specialty physicians need to do, and hospitals uh, need 
to do. Some of these uh, interventions are much more focused on longitudinal care, others more on episodic care. The Medicare Demonstration Project is really th uh, this box, high risk care management, focusing a lot of energy on the sickest and most costly uh, patients, but there are 19 other boxes that uh, need to be uh, fill, filled in, and we're in the process of prioritizing those uh, and investing substantially in, in doing those. Uh, another one that I'll just bring to your attention is variance reporting, performance dashboards, and I'm sure you, your organization has had some experience with that. Uh, we have done it uh, quite a bit in recent years when it comes to radiology utilization. We installed a computer system developed by our radiologists and, uh, and other clinicians uh, that all of our physicians need to use if they want to order high-cost imaging, namely MRI or CT for outpatients. And we developed uh, dashboards that show for each physician uh, on a per-patient basis how um, how their utilization compares to that of their uh, peers. And, and they also learn not only how many tests they were ordering, but how many tests that their, the specialists that they're referring patients to were, were ordering. Uh, what we've seen since the uh, installation of this system in 2006 is a significant shift in the uh, utilization of uh, high cost imaging by our primary care physicians. Uh, it's gone from an, an average uh, utilization of 16 uh, images per 100 patients per year to down to 12. That re reflects about a 25 percent reduction in utilization. And, and as a result of that, we've seen our utilization of some of those services uh, decline. And I'm sure for you, those are some of our most uh, profitable services. But we don't want to finance our organization on providing unnecessary care. We want to uh, finance our organization on providing care that adds value to our patients because that, in the long run, is, uh, is appropriate and s is what's going to be sustainable. We are now in the process of de designing an incentive uh, structure uh, for population health management across uh, the organization, uh, and this is very much an, uh, a work in progress. Uh, and we are thinking about this uh, in performance uh, incentive structure uh, as, as a three-layer cake, uh, which, which I'll try to explain to you. The first layer is the relationship between us and the payers, and there are contract terms in these various contracts that we've signed which define very specifically what the incentives are. The majority of the incentive in these contracts is trend management, managing down uh, PMPM uh, expenditures, but there's also a quality uh, component uh, as well. What we're, we've recently decided to do within partners is to establish an internal performance framework which allocates the uh, incentives to the individual components of partners, the MGH, the Brigham, uh, other uh, practice sites. And we've decided basically to disconnect these two layers because we didn't think that just by um, dividing up the contract terms to uh, various parts of the organization was necessarily the best way to go. And, and separating these two obviously carries certain risks associated with it. The next step after we've done this is to figure out how do we build into individual providers' uh, uh, compensation uh, frameworks uh, elements of, of this, this uh, layer cake. So this is the third layer, changing our faculty practice plans or, uh, or the, the methodology we use to pay individual physicians that make them somewhat at risk for uh, this world of population health, health management. And that, I suspect, will take years uh, to accomplish and will need to differ by, by specialty as our current uh, 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 faculty compensation plans currently do. Um, and then obviously we hope to learn from this and in the next round of uh, payers try to address, address the contract terms to make those uh, more, more helpful. So if you look at our contracts, about 80% of our overall risk is um, trend management, about 20% uh, quality related. If you look at this, uh, how we've allocated that risk to the partner's institutions, only 30% is related to trend. Uh, we've increased the quality component to 30, and we've identified some what we've labeled strategic uh, measures that we think are very important for our network, our system to do in order for us to be successful in population health management. These include things like reducing readmissions, uh, reducing hospital-acquired infections, um, hiring the staff necessary to do population health management. So we've identified a, what are mostly uh, process measures uh, that we think we wanted to reward people for doing in order to uh, move us along in population health management. We thought that would be more effective than simply uh, moving these percentages uh, down, down here. Now obviously there's a risk, as I said earlier, because these 
not, how, how people do here may differ than how we do here, and we've decided across partners that the Brigham, the MGH partners as a whole will backstop that disconnect. So if we have to pay out an incentive uh, as a result of this in internal performance framework, even when we're losing uh, with the payer, we're, we're prepared to, uh, to do that and, and suffer some additional losses there for the short term in order to uh, turn this uh, aircraft uh, carrier and get it uh, moving in the right direction. And as I said before, uh, we have not yet uh, tackled the issue of how we're going to translate these, this institutional risk to provider risk, and I think that will also require some uh, very interesting uh, discussions among our various specialty groups about how best to go about uh, doing that. So, so in closing, I, I just wanted to mention that I think to be successful in population health management requires at least three things. One is the infrastructure, the resources to work with the physicians, uh, be it case managers, reporting systems, et cetera. I think secondly are some incentives, although I should add that in our Medicare demonstration project, we used almost no in incentives. Uh, very, the physicians were incented uh, only a tiny bit for participating in the program. And I think last but not least, it requires leadership at all levels of the organization to convince people that this is important, that this is important not only for our own organization, but for society as a whole, um, and, and that we need, uh, there's really no other choice but to, uh, to head down this path and figure out how we as an organization can, uh, can not only make care better, but more affordable for our patients uh, and, and society as a whole. So I want to uh, thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any comments or questions that you might have. Thank you.